probably the the best word to sum all of this up would be legacy, right? So so when you're trying to avoid that rags to riches to rags scenario, you, know, you were asking me about mm-hmm. sell. It's like if you intentionally and systematically create legacy, create a family playbook, look at what a lot of these great families that actually do become more and more successful and more and more wealthy from generation to generation are doing, and you replicate that, then I think that's how you avoid that scenario. Boom, we're back. It's mind pump time. All right, here is the giveaway for today's episode, MAPS Powerlift. We're going to give away MAPS Powerlift to one of you viewers. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we will notify you and you have free access to MAPS Powerlift. Also, we got a sale going on right now. The starter bundle is 50% off. That's MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Prime, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. We also have MAPS Split 50% off. That's a bodybuilder style high volume workout, okay? So they're both 50% off. If you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code MAYSPECIAL for that discount. All right, here comes the show. I remember when you first started getting them doing the podcast and I was like, dude, that's so cool to see them. Like that to me as a father, that'd be like one of the coolest dreams is to one or two things. I feel like, cause these are like two big passions to me. I'm, I love sports. So if my son gravitates towards sports, it'd be very cool to be a part of that or business stuff. I just love building business. And I think yeah. watching them do that and their, how their minds work and everything like that. Yeah. And it's like, and so have you, have you made the connections of like, seeing how their minds work when it comes to business and how, how parallel they are with yours or how different are they? They're you? different because, um, so, so what I have focused on with them is not making all the mistakes that I made, meaning I'm not having them take like marketing classes or learn how to put up their WordPress posts or do any post editing on their audio or anything like that. I just tell them just just crush the one thing that you're good at. Mm. In this case, for a podcast like cooking and making the recipes and interviewing the chefs and mm-hmm. being like the face and the and the intellect behind the product, and then have other people do all the rest of the stuff and don't even waste your time learning it. Oh wow! Yeah, and so so they really they they, they aren't um they aren't like burdened with all the behind the scenes stuff because I've just told them from the get-go, pay somebody else to do that stuff because you could learn it, but at the end of the day, you're going to be paying somebody to do it anyways. Mm-hmm. If, do you remember you, when you, you learned that lesson? Oh, way too long into the get, like, <laughs> yeah. I will, cause I was a cheapskate, you know, operating with a spirit of scarcity. I didn't hire my first virtual assistant until I was like, you know, eight years into the business. And I would, wow. I coded all my own PHP scripts for my newsletter and I did all my own affiliate marketing. And I did, you know, all my own web design and all my own editing and all my own social media for a long time, which is, it's kind of good to learn that stuff. Mm-hmm. Probably the top reason being, you know, if you're getting screwed by somebody, yeah, <laughs> so you know how to hire like, people. Well, you want to charge me sixty thousand dollars to that <laughs> yeah, website? Yeah. Like, that technically, uh, yeah, you can yeah, I know how long that takes. Out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know how that goes. Yeah. Uh, and and so, you know, you, I I think that the the cons outweigh the pros, though, of of knowing and learning and spending the time doing it yourself versus just sticking to your craft, sticking to your art, and finding somebody else to do the well, rest. Well, to the yeah. modern uh, economy, is so it's so important to be so good at one specific thing and not do lots of different things. So it takes away from that. Yeah, right? yeah, and then, I mean, I'm I'm not against being a Renaissance person. I I think that's I think it's admirable. You know, I think it's it's laudable to be able to fix your car and fix your bicycle and you know mow your lawn and and, and all those things. But I, I think that when it comes to business. Yeah. Getting yeah, get getting bogged down in in the in the in you can't the scale that day. way. Yeah, you can, you can't scale, and I don't consider that. <laughs> I don't consider that being a Renaissance person as much as I consider that maybe kind of being stupid or being a micromanager, being cheap. Yeah, right. Because because I think a Renaissance person, it's more like somebody who's who's out there learning how to. There's a passion for engaging things. culture, yeah. how to survive, Firing how to build, how to fix. But yeah, when it comes to the business aspects, I just feel like you know, I, I I don't feel like. Knowing how to do your PPC ad buys is necessarily yeah. the best way to become. A well, they have a great person. teacher because you have experience yeah. in that. That's why I, I yeah. you know, I advocate a lot for mentorship. You know, you yeah. can take classes and courses, or you could go do a free internship or for somebody that is doing a great job and learn from them who have the experience. You'll learn yeah. all the you'll you'll cut through all the mistakes and stuff that you'll make on your own if you don't do that. 
Yeah, I mean, well, that's what that's how I've structured their entire education. It's all experiential based learning with very little time spent in books or or not necessarily not in classes, but even the classes are like live, hands on yeah. type of type of courses. Yeah. Now so, your your boys are fourteen, right? Yeah. So what, yeah. how is that? Because okay, so I have a sixteen year old, I have a twelve year old, so she's gonna go. She's almost a teenager. Boy, do I see the difference in having kids versus teenagers and just attitude and yep. complexity of right now. emotion and just conversations. Yeah. Like how's that, how's that been for you? You know, I haven't noticed a huge change. I mean, I was saying like, it's, it's, it's interesting because one of them is going through puberty right now and the other one isn't. And so I, I feel like, you know, cause like we're doing, we're doing sex ed, which is, which is really interesting. Cause I'm, I'm taking them through all the birds and the bees and everything. Cause right. I'd rather them learn all this from me than from YouTube or, or Google or, you know, their, their, you know, friend over at some sleepover or something like that. So, right. so I'm, I'm taking them through all of that. And it's, it's just, it's super interesting. So I have all these books that I'm bringing them through and dad's old anatomy textbooks. And we're talking about everything from porn and relationships to masturbation, to changes in girls' bodies, to changes in, in guys' bodies and, and just the, you know, soup to nuts. And uh, it is interesting, yeah, because because you know one of them is uh, is kind of ahead of the other developmentally. That's weird because they're know? twins. That, right? What do you? What, why? How is that? I don't normal? know. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. I mean, it, it might have been you know, the diet that one ate versus you know some piece of meat the other one didn't eat. I don't. I have no clue. But I don't think it's that uncommon for kids to go right. through yeah. at, at different times. Um, the yeah so so like you know during during sex ed I'm like so have 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 you guys had an erection yet you know and you know because you're just asking all these all these personal questions to them and and River my son who's older but hasn't gone through puberty yet he just looks at me like totally confused no clue what I'm talking about and Taryn's like oh yeah when I ride my bike yeah. time, <laughs> slide down the banister and and so he's got all these instances yeah, it's awesome and, dad yeah oh yeah now that we're talking and River's kind of sideways glancing at him yeah, just <laughs> Waiting for his turn <laughs> to get his or, or not. Yeah, he's like, I don't know if I want to. Yeah. I don't know if I want a hard on dad when I'm riding my bike. <laughs> that's so. Uh, that's yeah. so funny. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, and Taryn, you can you, you can smell him a little bit. He's got a little bit of the face acne, and but they're you know they're they're um yeah they're doing great. I mean, the, you know, even even like the uh, the teen beauty thing. I had the guy from uh, from Ollie Toro, that skincare company. He came up and and spent a day at our house, just shooting videos with him and teaching him how to do like clay masks and <laughs> and all all the things that I wish I'd known when I was a kid for you know not getting zits and acne and eczema and and all those embarrassing teenage skin the, issues. The last time we talked, you were talking about the the way you were unschooling them. And did you did you? come across anything that was challenging like obviously i've i've heard you talk about all the positive things and it sounds like a lot of good things have happened from that anything that was a, a real challenge of of going going that approach i think the challenge with unschooling is the the nature of it is that it's unstructured there's not really a plan there's not a curriculum like when i was homeschooled we had like your math curriculum and your yeah. reading curriculum. It was, it was basically like the equivalent of a traditional schooling setup, but at right. home gathered mm -hmm. around the kitchen table or on the living room floor or whatever. Right. But it was just all, was, you knew when you woke up, like what was going on? Like, right. oh, I'm going to do this course for math and then we go through this chapter for the reading. And then I've got this essay from this writing course, et cetera, et cetera. With unschooling, you know, the, the premise behind unschooling is you're constantly taking the temperature of what it is that a child is interested in. You know, whether, you know, for, for them, you know, if I could name a few things, it'd be like glass blowing, uh, watercolor, piano, guitar, jujitsu, um, Spanish cooking. You know, there's, there's like this, this list of things they just really enjoy to do and are super interested in. So what does that look every, like? You wake up in the morning and you go. Yeah. So, so every time a new interest arises. So, so we have a weekly meeting okay. with my sons, my wife, me, uh, a lady who helps us to like schedule everything, almost like, like a kind of like a, a virtual assistant for scheduling and organization and everything. And then kind of like a local boots on the ground person who helps us with scheduling trips to the museum and driving them places and classes and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then them. And so we're all on this call together and we're reviewing their week. We're reviewing anything new that it is that they're interested in that is, that has sparked their passion recently. Um, how it is that the previous week went, but then based on that, what we do is we'll create blocks of schooling 
where there'll be like a six week block that's focused on um, like the recent block that just finished up was really heavy on investing in finances. It was really heavy on creative writing because they're both working on, on some fiction stuff right now. Um, heavy on art uh, and then their their podcast. And um, and 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 we we piece all this together and then surround them with books with tutors, with mm. classes, with activities, with local excursions that basically are all based around those passions. But it's very loosey-goosey because you can't just like go online and find some set done right. for you yeah. curriculum. There's like one book that's pretty good called Unschooling to University that kind of like lays out what a what approximately you know unschooling program might look like from K through 12 and then on to college and it does talk about some little things that are important like record keeping you know every single day at the end of the day my sons have a journal of everything that they've done for that day that they scan and electronically send to the person who keeps all the records online that would then allow them to be able to show to the Washington State School District oh, what so it is still that they've learned. That way. Right, yeah. exactly. Or if a university ever wants to see a transcript of what they've actually done, if they decide they want to go to university, all that's logged. So we do a lot of record keeping. But yet, I, I think back, back to your question about what's hard about it yeah. is you kind of don't like at the back of your mind. There's always, you know, at least for me personally, I'm always wondering: Well, are they are they ahead? Are they behind? Right. Are right. they are right. they learning the things that they should be learning? Like, am I not teaching them enough about math or, or mm. science? Or if they haven't expressed an interest in chemistry, do I force that on them because I know it's going to be good for right. them to know later on? Right. Or do I wait Have until they, they express any- an interest in it? Have they done any like the state testing or examinations? Have you to, to just see kind no, of like no, where that is? Not or, yet, like a- not yet. But 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 I mean they they're they're smart. They're extremely happy. They're really balanced. I mean the home is a very pleasant place to be because they're just engaged in what it is they love to do. There's always two half days each week where they can just wake up in the morning do whatever they want. You know, whether it's free time for art or free time for being outside in nature, go outside to build a fort or whatever. So we, we schedule a lot of like free, unstructured, free creative play time. And I think that's really important. What too. do you see? Okay. Since yeah. you do that and, and you already have this very kind of unstructured curriculum for them, what do you, what do they tend to gravitate towards during their free time? Do they tend to gravitate towards the things that is already kind of school related or like, what do they do? 90% of the time it's art. They're, they're super into art. Mm-hmm. They, they paint, they do comic books, they do murals, they do, um, they, they do comics. They're writing a cookbook right now. It's like a graphic novel meets cookbook where all of the recipes are actual comics. Um, they're amazing artists. They're the, my, uh, my wife, Jessa, she's an amazing artist. I grew up super into art, watercolor painting. You know, I, I would, I would, you know, enter into like art competitions and put my paintings in the fair. And oh, wow. I kind of got out of painting, but both mama and I come from very artistic, creative backgrounds, oh. um, mostly musically and artistically. So both of our sons are really into that as well. Yeah. I had a friend cool. who, who did this with their kid and I would ask, cause I had no idea this even existed back then. And I asked him, well, how do you teach math? Like, cause all the stuff you listed didn't, wasn't math. And she said, well, He's really into cars, so when we talk about the engines, we talk mm-hmm. about ratios, the ratios. With the gears, right. yeah. and you know how you figure horsepower over torque, and like you talked about jujitsu, you could talk about Baking. leverage and a fulcrum and how that increases leverage on this point versus that point. Chemistry, you could talk about cooking. Yeah, that's, right? so there's a lot of ways thing, you could do that. Is, right? is you can be very creative. So even like Washington State has twelve key core subjects that a child must demonstrate proficiency and not to be considered like a, like a truant, you know, and if you don't want a social worker winding up at your door as you're submitting these right. records, you want, you want to show, demonstrate that they've, that they've taken certain, okay. certain courses. So if you think about it, like what you were alluding to, Sal, like, like, you know, making risotto in the kitchen could be chemistry. It could be math totally. because of the measurements. It could even be if there's like a, like an ethnic twist to it, some type of social studies or language studies. I mean, like making a meal can satisfy like six of those curricular building a tree for it can be math. It's also real world application, physical education. Yeah. But it's all real world application. That's back to what I was talking about earlier. You know, the, the tricky part is that unschooling because you don't have a set of curricula. It's difficult, especially for a guy like me. I'm, I'm one of those guys who loves to see the plan. Like what's the plan? What's the schedule? Yeah. You know, how's it all laid out? Whereas it's a little bit more loosey goosey when you're unschooling, you kind of just like wake up and, you know, ask your 
children what it is they're interested in then just send them out into the world i mean did, to, did, does it take a lot so of yeah does it take a lot of thinking for you when they, okay let's say they decide okay we're going to make risotto tonight and do you do you decide like okay well then we are we're going to learn chemistry we're going to do math or do you maybe pick one subject that we're going to focus on for that one no thing? we we just do it and then what what actually happens to be honest with you is we'll do an activity and then they'll journal it. They'll write it all down. And then they'll send it off to, uh, her name's Darcy, this, this gal who I hired a few years ago when we first started this, who you know, uh, you know, does a lot of the scheduling and the, the spreadsheet layouts of what the curriculum block might look like. She then takes their records and says, okay, these are the subjects that, that, that fit in terms of, of what that activity actually satisfied. Got it. You know what I'm oh, saying? So, so I don't do a lot of that. She, she does all that. Yeah, but you know, one of the biggest yeah. critiques that kids will say, and I remember saying this too, is where am I going to use this? Like, where, yeah. where, and so with something like that, you're actually seeing it work in the real world. Yeah. That question never comes up because they're, they're very rarely learning something that they're not already interested in or that they're not already engaged in, in the right. first place. I mean, they even have like a, a math and finances instructor. Cause a lot of this stuff is tutor based, like a math and finances <laughs> instructor comes over to the house a couple of times a week. Spanish instructor comes over, you know, they, they meet with a private jujitsu instructor. Like they've got a lot of like, like tutors and, and classes, but you know, like the math and finances guy, when he comes over, I've been very clear with him. I'm like, I don't want anything to be non-experiential. Meaning like if they're going to learn finances, you guys are going to all get in the car, you're going to drive to the bank. They're going to learn how to talk to the teller. They're going to learn what the other people in the little cubicles back behind the teller are doing. They're going to learn how to get cash out. They're going to learn the difference between the debit card and the credit card. But it's not like they're doing that from a book. They're actually at the bank, boots on the ground, yeah, cool. learning all of that. Yeah, I, so, I would say the the only challenge I could see with this is and it's also a good thing, but also a challenge is as a parent, you don't just drop your kid off. You're super involved. You're super it's involved, a lot yeah. more work, right? Would that be accurate to say? Yeah, that's the tricky part is – you know, and and I'm I'm constantly questioning that myself is how much of this phase of my life should be all about the kids versus how much am I still building my own career, you know, and building my own business because it's 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 kind of paradoxical. Like you you have children or or a spouse who you're trying to prepare and provide for. And that's part of the reason that you work, but then you're also working just to be able to, to build your own impact, you know, to build your mm -hmm. brand to build your business, et cetera. And so I, I, um, I do question a lot, you know, like how much time do I actually spend focused on all the schooling and the curriculum and everything versus, mm -hmm. versus the business. So, you know, I, I, I don't really have a perfect answer for it, but it, there's, there's a lot of engagement or a lot more engagement required of the parent. Now, primarily what, what I do with them is I do physical education with them, meaning that every week, like I've get, just got basically like four set criteria. We do kettlebells, heat, cold, and breath work. I'm convinced that like, if you, if you got those four things as part of physical education, like you're going to create a pretty resilient human being because, mm -hmm. because they're, they're learning how to move an asymmetrical object that requires a, a great deal of core stability with the kettlebell. They're learning resilience and focus and tolerance to stress in the heat. They're learning nervous system regulation and more stress resilience in the cold. And then with the breath work, they're getting a really intimate relationship with how to control their physiology using their breath, you know, mm -hmm. how to, how to train CO2 tolerance and breath hold. So every single week they're working out with me and, you know, for example, we'll go out and we'll do like a ladder of one up to 20 kettlebell swings with push ups, and then we'll drop straight into 20 minutes of breath work in the sauna. And then we'll just go straight into, you know, 32 degree water for three minutes to finish up in the cold. And then we'll go off and have dinner together. And so I do the physical education with them and I, a lot of times will write out like I'll every Sunday night, I'll write out the other things they're going to do during the week too. Like sometimes I'll, I'll just be like, okay, so this week you've got seven, aside from the workouts that you do with dad, you've got seven, one mile walk in your bare feet, right? So every day at some point during their school day, That's they're cool. just like taking their shoes off, heading outside one mile walk. And a lot of times they'll just go out and do this stuff together, or I'll, I'll give them some kind of a new barbell complex to learn. I'll show it to them and tell them, okay, you guys got to do this two times this week, whether it's with dad or, or on your own. And then I also do the spiritual disciplines with them each morning uh, and in the evening. So the, so the physical disciplines 
are one part that I really commit to as being a present and engaged father for. And then the spiritual disciplines, what that looks like is at about 6 a.m. So I usually get up around 4.30 or 5, kind of get some of my own morning, you know, stretching and foam rolling and have some coffee. And I do a little bit of, of um, a little bit of breath work. I'll use some of my biohacks. Like I got this thing called a biocharger and I'll jump up and down on the trampoline. Just do it. Just my you know, morning self-care. It's just yeah. fun. I enjoy that. You know, I, I like to wake up and have like a good hour just to take care of myself and wake up and kind of, kind of have a little bit of affluence of time to approach the day. Then I get them up and I, I put on some really nice music in the house. I, I like this channel called soaking worship on Spotify. It's like this perfect music. You, you, you feel like the whole home's like this temple or church. It's like really, <laughs> really nice orchestral tunes or piano music or a lot of like old school hymns set to kind of like, you know, epic instrumentation. And so I put that on and that that's usually about 6 a.m. So the house is quiet until then. And then I put that on, I'll turn on some lights. I light some candles, I burn some incense, and then I call them down. And so when they come down from their bedroom, it's like they're walking into like this sacred temple, this peaceful setting in the home. And we all sit down on meditation cushions in the living room. We do a few rounds of Wim Hof to kind of like get, just charge up the body for the day, get the breath work going. As soon as we finish breath work, we go into prayer. We have a little devotional that we go through. We read some scripture, we pray some more, we continue to listen to the music. And so every morning for about 15 minutes, basically we're just doing mm -hmm. devotions, meditation, prayer, et cetera. And then they go up to their bedroom, they get ready for the day. I go down to my office and work for a while. And then at 7.30, the whole family meets in the living room again, and we do a morning meditation. And the morning meditation is all based on what it is that you're grateful for that day or from the previous day. And we're all visualizing this and going through it and, and seeing it in our minds. And then we do service. We write down one person who we can pray for or help or serve that day. We do tapping so that at the end of the meditation, we're basically using like, like neuro-linguistic programming. You kind of like tap on a certain area, like mine is right over my heart right here. I set an anchor. And the reason that we do that is because when you're in that deep state of relaxation and peace from the morning meditation, when you set an anchor, what I tell my sons is any time later on in the day where you're stressed out or where you know life just seems to be coming at you too fast, you can tap in that same location and it brings you back into that same state of peace that you experience during the morning meditation. And then we also do just basically like a six count in, six count breath during that meditation, you know, eyes closed, tongue resting on the roof of the mouth or, or tongue pressed up against the roof of the mouth. And we're just basically setting a standard at the beginning of the day. And then after we do all that, we finish typically with like the Lord's prayer, you know, like our father art in heaven, hallowed be thy mm -hmm. name. We, we do that whole prayer together. And then we all come together as a family because my wife is down there for that session as well, even though she's not there for that early, early morning session that we do. We all come together as a family, we do like a group hug, kind of like a team hug, team huddle. And then we have a quick meeting about what all's going on that day. You know, who's going where, what kind of classes are happening, you know, what time are we having dinner, what's for dinner, who's cooking, who's pitching in here, who's pitching in there. And then we just basically, you know, it's like clap, clap and scatter. And everybody yeah. just goes off and, and we start into our day. And, you know, most of us are at home. My my office is at home. My wife works from the home. So we're all kind of kind of at home during the day. We see each other. But that's like the official kind of like meeting to launch the day. And then uh, my my wife, she's a she's a total spiritual warrior. Like she like from the time that we do that morning meditation to about 930 for two hours, she goes upstairs into the bedroom and she literally has like a meditation cushion that she sits on. And she's up there for two hours, just like reading and praying and meditating and journaling and just mapping out how she's going to help people the rest of the day. And then she just basically, you know, have, comes down. Have you ever heard the, the family? Have you ever heard the critique? Because I've seen statistics on kids that, uh, that are either homeschooled or unschooled. And it's, there's not a lot on this because there haven't been, but although today you're seeing more and more kids or families moving this direction and the success rates are actually phenomenal when you compare to the average kid. And the critique I've heard is that really has, it's just the parents are just way more involved. So people have, I've heard people say this like, oh, the methods or whatever. It's just because right. the parents are way more involved. The parents were way more yeah. involved with the. I, I think that that could you're be so involved, right? part of it. But at the same time, if you look 
past the parental involvement, which of course the, the time that a parent spends with the child is extremely formative in, the, in terms yes. of the, just that child's sense of safety and belonging and, you know, being, being seen and heard. And, and also loved. just a parent that cares so much, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think that there are some other potential failures of something like a modern traditional public schooling system, everything from rote memorization of facts when really we live in an era where, you know, Google and automation Very and artificial true. intelligence dictates that rote memorization of facts is not necessarily something that's going to serve you that well that's versus, you know, creative thinking. Yeah, and, I, and remember, creative I remember my teacher solving. saying, you're not going to have a calculator in your pocket all the time. Yeah. Like, well, you actually yeah. <laughs> we yeah. do now. <laughs> but I mean, you know, learning at the, having to learn at the same pace as everybody in the classroom or, you know, being subjected to bullying and peer pressure. And, and I, I think there's, there's some other things that happen in a traditional schooling system that would dictate that, you know, above and beyond just the fact that there's more parental involvement in traditional or, or in unschooling or homeschooling that there's some other things going on in a public traditional schooling mm. setting that are just kind of like outdated. You just named something like bullying. Well. I mean, does it ever concern you that that they don't have to deal with some adversities like that? Because you could make the case that there's some some value to actually having to go through that yeah. and overcome it, right? So do you do you ever worry about that? Yeah, that you maybe you ever don't... engineer it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He hires bullies <laughs> to show up and <laughs> hire people to come in. And that'd be man. funny. <laughs> yeah. Send them out for their yeah. one mile barefoot <laughs> walk kids, and get old. Billy the 17 <laughs> year old you waiting there a half mile down the road to so, throw the rocks at him yeah. on their hey, stupid you just took your bike hey. Get out. <laughs> what did we learn Kick from today? in their yeah, face what's, what's today's lesson uh, kids you know what I, I think that with sports you know being in jiu-jitsu and having to roll against you That's know guys who are older than them yeah. or bigger than That's them and you know, having to, you know, they're, they're playing tennis. Like they said, they're doing the kettlebells and the heat and the, and the ice and the, yeah. the breath work. And I yeah. think you can build resilience in other ways than, than That's just a good being point. Do you ever, bullied. Do you, here's something we've talked about sure. a lot. I'd love to ask you this uh, as well. I, I'm a first generation um, American. My parents were poor immigrants. Uh, Adam, didn't, he grew up in a pretty tough situation. Justin's family wasn't super wealthy. Now, we're all far more successful than our parents were. And we always talk about like, how can we make our kids, like we don't want to raise a bunch of privileged, uh, you know, acting kids. We want to make sure that they understand the value of work and money, even though they have all this way more stuff than we did or way more opportunity than we did. You ever think about that? Like, how can I create that? I'm like, what are the best ways? I do. Uh, It's the all too common regs to riches to regs scenario that we see, especially, Mm -hmm. you know, in America where you can make a name for yourself. And so, uh, uh, you know, a man or a woman who is poor will will work hard. They'll put their nose to the grindstone. They'll chop wood. They'll carry water. And then they'll supply their child with with a very privileged life. And and their their goal in many cases, oh, I want my child to be able to have the freedom without the stress of worrying financially or worrying about Maslow's hierarchy of needs to be able to go forth and yeah. just do all the things that I wish I was able to do when I was a kid, but I wasn't privileged enough to have access to some of some of some of you know the finer things in life or the ability to be able to just engage in a lot of the creative things that I wanted to engage in because I was so worried about just surviving. Right. Right. And so then what happens is the the parent who has who has created wealth gives it to the child. Right. And so the child never learns the same type of work ethic that the parent built, the child winds up squandering the family's wealth, often getting into trouble, you know, becoming a black sheep. And this is painting with a broad brush, but it happens a lot. Sure. And then and then the family wealth is squandered. That child has a child who then grows up in a poverty stricken scenario and you start the whole sequence mm-hmm. over and over and over again. So it's like that rags to riches to rags scenario. And you look at some families, you know, not that I would necessarily agree with everything that's going on with these families, you know, politically or ethically, but you you look at like the Rockefellers or the Bushes or the Clintons and you see, you're like, well, how do, how do these families like get subsequently wealthier with each generation and subsequently more successful with each generation? You almost see like a riches to riches to riches type of scenario. And if you get down and you look at, at what a lot of these families are doing, they've got a family constitution. They've got a family trust. They've got a family bank. They've got a, a, a family mission statement. They have a set of family values. The entire family is actually run more like a business would be run. And that that's something that I actually studied up on for the past couple of years because 
I wanted to ensure that I didn't create that scenario with my children because, you know, by God's good graces, I, I've I've found success. Like I've I, you know I've been I've been blessed with it with a platform and, and with some some good businesses, and so I could give my kids, you know, a lot in terms of saying, okay, well, I'm just gonna you know I'm gonna pay for your college, I'm gonna pay for your cars, I'm gonna pay for what you need, and you guys you know make art and become little you know creative, <laughs> you know, five star Michelin chefs or whatever. I don't necessarily think that that's the best way to create character and to create work ethic, especially in a, in you know in a, in a young human being. And so, what we did was um, a, f- a few things, um, with probably the most notable being that I've worked for the past couple of years to create this playbook for the Greenfield family, and the playbook has our family mission statement in it. It has all of our family values in it. It has all of our traditions in it, meaning here's what the Greenfield family does at Christmas. Here's what we do at Easter. Here's what we do at Thanksgiving. It has all the the ritualized ceremonial comings and goings that occur at different ages for each of the children. At age eight, this is when we have the talk about you know sex and the birds and the bees. Or, or at age twelve, this is when they go through their rite of passage into adolescence. And at age fourteen or fifteen, this is when they go through their rite of passage into adulthood. Both of my sons know at age sixteen that's when they quit getting money. Period. Like at that point, they are expected to take care of themselves. They're expected to pay for their own food. They're expected to buy their own car. They're expected to pay for their own college. They know already, and they've known since they were 12 years old, they're not getting a dime from me. And so they're already having to think. Mm. And I remind them about this about every month or so. I'm like, all right, guys, how, how's how's the, the, yeah. the books coming and the comic books? And when my son's, he's getting into NFTs now and, and creating art that he's that he's selling as NFTs on OpenSea. And and so they're, they're, they know that when they turn 16, they got to have some sort of of a, a foundational source of income set up for themselves because the way that the Greenfield family playbook goes is that they aren't getting a bunch of money from their parents after the age of 16. Now, the family trust distributes family wealth, especially if, if mom and I were to not be around anymore to die. You know, the kids get a certain amount of wealth at age 25. They get a certain amount at age 35. They get a certain amount at age 45. But any any wealth that's accumulated in our trust is not distributed to them all at once should mom and I pass away. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it, the, the little parts of that playbook though, are, are really, really interesting. Like we have a family logo, right? Family logo on our hats, on t-shirts, on hoodies, on family mugs. There's two giant flags outside the front door that fly the family logo, almost like a castle on each side. The family mailbox has the family logo on it. There's a giant crest above the fireplace. It's this gorgeous metal sculpture that's got the family logo and all these stones are on the outside of it, which each, with each of the family symbols, every time a new grandchild or child gets added to the family, their unique symbol, you know, like my wife's is a seed, I'm a tree, my son Taryn is a leaf, my son River is like a wave of water. Well, every time they have a child or their child has a child, that new symbol gets added to the crest. That's so cool. what we've got going on is the, this this... Um, hmm. it, it, it's, it's as though the Greenfield name is something that means something as far as my sons being able to say, Hey, this is what the family stands for. These are our values. These are our mission statements. When they get married and they have their own family, I'll hand them that playbook and they, they aren't going to even need to, to remember because it's all written down there. Gosh, what did, what did dad do with us when we were 12? You know, what happened when we were 16? How, you know, what, how, 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 how do we even make like a family constitution or a family trust or a family bank? Like all of that is already done. And so probably the, the best word to sum all of this up would be legacy, right? So, so when you're trying to avoid that rags to riches to rags scenario, you, know, you were asking me about mm-hmm. sell. It's like if you intentionally and systematically create legacy, create a family playbook, look at what a lot of these great families that actually do become more and more successful and more and more wealthy from generation to generation are doing, and you replicate that, then I think that's how you avoid that scenario. It's just that this knowledge is not that common. A lot of people don't know how to do it. There are books out there though, that that, that I had no idea. I've never heard stuff. of this. This sounds love yeah, it. brilliant. Like uh, for example, uh, the book uh, "What Would the Rockefellers Do?" that teaches you how to set up your family constitution, your family bank. I mean, I've got whole life insurance policies on my wife, on me, on both of my sons that we do paid up additions to every month. So we've got basically like four different banks that we can draw from and borrow against. You know, using using ourselves as a bank while at the same time providing 
you know, protection for us should we die. Uh, there's another foundation called the Legato Family Foundation, L-E-G-A-D-O, and they actually specialize in working with families to set up this type of legacy-based situation where you actually do have things like a, a playbook and a crest and a mission statement and family values and family traditions and comings and goings. And then I think kind of hand in hand with that is the whole rite of passage thing, especially for boys, especially for boys, you know, because- we don't have a phys- yeah. biological rite of passage. Like we don't have a biological rite of passage, right? We, so, so little boys don't go through a period like little girls do, uh, you know, and, and a girl does have a pretty significant time of her life where she experiences that, that distinct transition into womanhood, either when, when, during the onset of menstruation or when she has a child. Right. And, and a boy, yeah, they go through puberty. I don't know about you guys though, but there, there's, like I never had a part of my boyhood where I was told, Hey, you're a man now. Yeah. Right. You're, you're a man. No. Like you don't have to work. Like you, like I read, you don't have to prove to the world that you're a man. You don't have to go off and do 20 years of Ironman triathlons and Spartan races and all this <laughs> shit to like prove to the world that, that you're, that you're a man. Share a little bit of insecurity. You don't, you don't have to be, yeah. You don't have to, you don't have to be a Great. man with a man's body walking around with a, with a boy's psyche and emotions. Because again, like you didn't go through any period that was ceremonially recognized as you having transition from boyhood into manhood. By the way, lots of and, cultures have these uh, ceremonial, you know, yeah. traditions with boys. Lots and, of them. And some lots of, of cultures them, that don't are kind of like disturbing, you know, like there's sure. some Native American tribes where they'd hang the, I mean, you can read about this. They'd like hang the boys when they're 14 or 15 years old via like meat hooks through their skin from the tribe hut and beat them with buffalo skulls. And then you know, <laughs> let them down. They drag the skulls like from their skin via chains through the streets well, until the man skull, and then they finish <laughs> up and they get their pinky cut off so they can prove that they're a warrior. And like, yeah, no, yeah, I think no. my, my, son, my sons are getting their twice. pinky cut off yeah, with, yeah, the, with the cut coat steak and the, knife and anytime the, soon. <laughs> but uh, the, the rite of passage, um, in the adolescence that my son's experience was four days out in the wilderness, wool blanket, backpack, knife. I, mom and I dropped him off like 90 miles away from our house. And they were, they had a couple, you know, typically the father does not, does not facilitate these ceremonies. Usually it's the uncle or a mentor or so, because part of it is, is you're killing your parents, right? You're, right. you're, you're Breaking cutting the cord. Free, yeah. Right. And so dad's not going to be out there in the forest with you, but I'm also not going to just drop him out in the middle of Idaho far north Idaho all by themselves. And so I had a couple of instructors who would like keep an eye on them, yeah. make sure they were alive. But yeah, I mean, they spent four days out there. They came back, they had a ceremony, they had a, a fire ceremony and a speech that they gave and a gathering feast. And, um, and then they had a weekend with me where, where we, we did just a ton of talking and solo father son time. And then at that point, like we quit calling them boys. Like we, you know, if we shout up to the bedroom, we don't go, Hey boys come down. Like they're called young men now or river and Terran or twins or, or whatever. But we changed our vernacular in the household. They were given a deeper sense of responsibility. They were given more chores. They started getting up earlier with dad for things like the spiritual disciplines. It was mm-hmm. kind of like, okay, this is the next phase of life when they're, uh, uh, they're 14 now, so it would be next year. So 15 March of 2023, they'll go through the rite of passage into adulthood. It'll be longer. It'll be more harrowing. Um, it'll you know involve, again, more time in the wilderness. It'll probably involve a type of ego-dissolving plant medicine ceremony at the end of all of that so that they can then kind of go through, through that whole experience of ego dissolution. And then that'll be their transition to adulthood. And a few months later, they'll start to pay for, for everything that they need in life. And so now, now, they're not going to grow up wondering if, they, if they're men. What if, okay. So let's, so let's say they're 16 and one of your kids is like, he's just not making any money. It's like, you don't give him any food. Well, I mean, look, how does that come to be a total asshole dad? <laughs> so, so the, the, the thing is, um, it, uh, we I, don't know I, this yet either. Yeah, you're you're yeah. assuming that's either he's not going to. Well, no, what I, the reason why I'm asking that is I know people are wondering that because when you're dealing right. with 16 year olds, you know, sometimes it's like, no, I'm not doing what you right. tell me, you know, right. which is a normal part of being a teenager where you want right. to rebel. Right. That's kind of right. normal. Right. Right. So if my son says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not working and I'm not going to make the money to pay for my own food or to pay for my room board or, yeah. or to buy my own car or buy my own college. I mean, that comes down to another big part of the way that we parent, which is consequential based parenting. Like we rarely discipline. We rarely say no in our house. There are, there are no rules for screen time. There's no rules for porn. There's no rules for alcohol. There's no rules for gluten. There are no rules in our house. 
we just basically educate them really, really well on the consequences of any decision that they might make in life and then let them deal with the natural consequences, right? So, um, you know, whatever, screen time, right? They, th- we, they're, they're allowed unfettered access to technology, but they do see when mom and I have downtime, we're rarely on our phones. We're playing musical instruments or reading real books or outside in nature or working out. So they don't have a model of parents who yeah. are just like stuck to their phones. And furthermore, like when we have our big, you know, every night at our house is a, is a freaking party. Like 7 p.m. rolls around. The entire family's in the kitchen. We're doing a song. We're doing a story. We're making dinner together. We're making dessert together. We're cleaning together. We're doing story time up in the bedroom. We're doing music. We're playing board games. We're playing card games at the table. Nobody's thinking about video games or technology or their phones because we've made so many other aspects of life so much more fun and engaging and real compared to mm. you know the, the social media or something like that. That, you know, that it's, it's just not something that that they turn to in our home, and so. When it comes to to something like what's going to happen when they're 16, if they decide that, that they're not going to get a job, they're not going to pay, well, I mean, it just comes down to the same way we've always parented, and I will do the same thing I've always done. I'll tell them, well, look, that's that's fine. Here's what it feels like to be hungry. Here's what it's going to feel like to eat Top Ramen. And, and you know, and, and I, I have a strong hunch that after they experience that life for a while that, that they'll decide that they actually do like making money yeah, and paying yeah. for themselves. I read a book on that and it was like, to make it more simple, it was like, your kid, you tell your kid, wear your jacket, it's cold outside. I don't want to wear yeah. my jacket. So, right. all right, you don't yeah. have to wear your jacket and then you go outside and it's cold and they're freezing. Right. And you just say, yeah, you know, that sucks, buddy. It is cold. And 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 you, you, you have to draw the line somewhere. Like if you have right. a two-year-old and they're toddling towards a freaking cliff, don't tell them, hey, the bottom of that cliff is going to really suck. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah there's spiky rocks and it's going to yeah. hurt. So, sure. you know, you make your decision for that. No, you grab them off the edge of the cliff. If they're yeah. toddling towards a hot stove. You know, you, you say you, you don't want your kid getting a third degree blister sure. on there. I mean, if, if they do it again and again, yeah, maybe you would want to kind of let them touch the stove and notice that's hot and they're not yeah. going to make that, that decision again. Yeah. So, so you got to have some wisdom and prudence and discernment as a parent. But for the most part, you let them deal with the consequences of their decision. You let them deal with any stomach issues or neural inflammation that they might experience after just going ape nuts on gluten at the birthday party. Um, yeah, because yeah, they also made the case, and I thought this was actually quite brilliant, as they said, you know, if if you don't, allow them to get these con- these mild consequences as a kid, the consequences as you get older get bigger and bigger because yeah. then it becomes, you know, drunk driving or taking too many drugs or unprotected sex where it could have been stomach ache or I'm really tired because I didn't get good sleep and I still got to go to school or, yep. you know, like I said, I'm cold because I didn't wear a jacket. And it makes sense to me. It definitely yeah. makes sense to me. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I should clarify. I mentioned I mentioned how there's like no rules for for pornography, for right. example, at our house. And certainly, as part of this this sexual education that I've done with them, I've taught them about, for example, the 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 dopaminergic desensitization that occurs when you are engaged in the in the evolutionarily mismatched scenario of seeing sequences of extremely beautiful naked women over and over again like that's not something that we from an ancestral standpoint have even evolved to be able to deal with you know it's like dopamine 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 click 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 swipe 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 and eventually you just become desensitized and as i think all of us know with porn what that typically leads to is you need more and more stimulus then you know then you go to threesomes and you go to donkeys yeah. and you go, whatever <laughs> else you know and so it's, it's kind of like clowns, that slippery probably. slope yeah clowns it's, it's and, totally and, and threesomes and donkeys. so yeah threesomes <laughs> right, donkeys. Right um and <laughs> then you know I, i've also taught them about how it results in objectification of women how you can't you know be sitting there at night scrolling through 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 photos and and porn in the evening and then wake up and go interact with the uh, with the members of the opposite sex and not be thinking about that when you're talking to, you know, your, your, your girlfriends or, or, you know, or, or women that you might see, like, like those images will yeah. still go through your head. And I, I talked to them about how they would feel if that was their sister or their mom or their daughter who were thrust into that industry and, 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 and you know, basically were having to, to make money for themselves doing something that they didn't technically want to do, but that, you know, that, that basically was something that they got, you know, forced into but, or had ben, to do I want to comment money. on what you said about the dopamine. I read a study that showed that it, it, it actually causes a similar adaptation process in the brain as 
drugs. So like yeah. you use a drug, you get this dopamine, serotonin, whatever, your brain adapts and you get a smaller response requiring more drugs. And then what yeah. happens when you're off the drugs completely is regular life is depressing, right? So then they see similar effects to the brain with pornography and we it's it hasn't this kind of accessibility hasn't been around long enough. We're starting to see now studies though that are starting to show some some really interesting negative effects. Some of them are like erectile dysfunction, which yeah. we never saw with the men in their 20s. That, yeah. that didn't right. exist. Way, way young. Now there's right. tons of them um, and just lots of other issues. Are you are you reading any other studies on yeah. these effects? Yeah, and, and most of that is spelled out. Uh, you know, There's a website like yourbrainonporn.com. Mm. Uh, I think the other one is, is war on porn or something like that. But yeah, it does get into the neurotransmitter desensitization that occurs. You know, when you're just constantly flooding the receptors with the dopamine rush that happens when when you're looking at photographs or videos, you know, the 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 body just becomes desensitized. So I, I, I have three sections in that book, Endure, on porn, sex, and polyamory. And, and my take on all three, I talk about some of that science in the porn section about that desensitization that occurs. And the reason I brought all that up is back to the natural consequences thing mm -hmm. and back to the, well, where, where do you draw the line with the hot stove or with the cliff? So it turns out that like 90% of the, 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 the situations in which uh, an adolescent is exposed to porn is accidental. It's accidental like that for it's not like a kid is 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 going online and searching for whatever hot babe pussy or whatever. Yeah. It's like they're on some website or some YouTube video or whatever. And then it's kind of like there's a pop up that occurs or or a link to click or even like a phishing email or, or whatever. Right. And you wind up accidentally on a website where all of a sudden there's all this imagery that, you know, for, for a young innocent mind, it's just, it, it, it's all of a sudden right in their face and yeah. they don't know what to do with it. And a lot of times then they, they start down the rabbit hole and they click and they become intrigued because that's just the way the human brain works. So and it, like, I actually have a, a, a software protection program installed on their eye touches and on their MacBooks called canopy. And it, it does restrict a lot of these websites from being able to pop up. Right, so that would be an example where, yeah, I'm mm. using consequential based parenting, but I'm also putting up some fences, you know, just to make right. sure that yeah. they're protected because I know about I the know accidental that exposure huh? that occurs. <clears throat> yeah, like most of the time, it's it's not that a child is actively seeking out. I this wasn't stuff seeking even, it the first time. I came even interested. It. Do, you remember, in it. do you remember for no, you? No, I was you? neither. I yeah. I remember my wife. Same thing. It was yeah. just like we were just in college. Like my wife, she's at the she's at the college library, and all of a sudden, like yeah. you know, she's. Yeah, it's it's like some advertisement that pops up and a bunch of videos and and wow. then yeah and, no I was and looking for it when I was all, of sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden your innocence is destroyed yeah, and then eventually yeah. you know, especially as guys like then we're like oh yeah. wow this world exists. well I mean, speaking of which so you have two boys okay and you yeah. talked about them becoming men and it it seems like the that well it's not seems like I think this is absolutely true we we have glorified completely being remaining boys and made being a man. And I'm going to define that for a second, but being a man is being a bad thing. In other words, boys are, you know, you make money, you bang all the chicks, you got no responsibility, you got fast cars, you're cool, nothing yep. tying you down. I don't need kids because I can do whatever yeah. I want. Being a man is like responsibility, wife, family, have a job, you know, that kind of stuff. Boring. And yeah, yeah. Not only boring, <laughs> but it's like your life is over. That yeah. really sucks. So, yeah. so, so having boys, it's like all the media is showing them that, well, you know, you watch TV. It's like dads are dumb. Mm -hmm. Dads get, you know, Homer Simpson and yeah. the guy from the modern family, uh, uh, Phil, Phil Duffy yeah. and the family guy, dad, uh, Peter, yeah, and, exactly. And, and yeah, they're they're buffoons. Modern dads are buffoons. Buffoons yeah. and tied down and yeah. unhappy and it sucks and it's so much better to have no responsibility. Right. And, you know, as a guy, yeah, like this Jay, is, what's his name? James Dean. Yeah, and, yeah, and, like and as a guy, you know, part of the challenge is this is true. As a man, you become more attractive the older you get and the more money you get. So we don't have the same natural limitations or should I say barriers that a woman may feel when she feels she starts to feel responsible earlier. She's like, Well, I got a biological clock. And I want to settle down. And guys are like, whoa, I'm 35 now and more girls are interested in me. And I'm making more money and I never want to grow up. And this is so fun. How are you going to, yeah. how do you deal with that with your boys and really communicating to them? Like, look, it looks cool, but it's not, that's not where it's at. I, I think a big part of it is the example yeah. that you set. Like my sons 
see when I when I take them to conferences or events with me, they see that I'm helping people. And I don't want to sound like narcissistic right now, but I'm I'm, I'm just 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 briefly, yeah. like they see that I'm making impact. They see when people come up to me and hug me and tell me that they've they've rediscovered God or they've rediscovered their health or the, or they've found their fitness or they've done an Ironman triathlon or they they've gotten connected with their family, or their sons, or repaired their relationship with their parents. You know any, any of the kind of things that I talk about. My sons see that. Um, that, that I'm making impact. Yeah. They see again back to the legacy, the idea that you can live for something greater than the temporary pleasure that comes from sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That that that's you know all too commonly glorified in our modern day and age. They they see that there's more that you can live for. There's more impact that you can make. They see the joy that arises when you have like a stable nuclear household with with you know I've been married to my wife for 19 years, and they see mom and I as like best friends and lovers and they see us going off on dates and adventures and playing tennis together and going on hikes and and you know going to dinners together and helping people in the local community and and they see in their own lives you know that this this whole concept of like the greenfield family having a a a unified mission statement and a unified set of values yeah. and so there there's very little emphasis placed upon the 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 benefits of being like your own person or not, not your own person, but, but kind of like what, what you just laid out. Yeah, no Sal. Like, like yeah. 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 Like that, that free loving, almost like, yeah, it is glorified. Just like, the, like a kid. The well, the truth is at, at one point in student. their life, they are going to get to a point where maybe they even dabble in that or think about that or are tempted with that. But if you've established what you've done so well for so long, so consistently, I feel like that's what will always pull them back. Well, what, yeah. You know, what really taught mm -hmm. me, I'll tell you what taught me that. Cause I was young when I had my first kid was, uh, I figured out, it took me a while by the way, because I was young and I did think I was missing out when I all of a sudden had all this responsibility when I had my first kid. But I thought to myself, I'd never trade it back. Like, yeah, but would I ever trade my kid for going back? No way. And it was communicated. The way it was communicated to me was like, this is like, you have, yes, you got more responsibility, more stress, and it's more expensive. It's also way more meaningful. And now you have real, now you're going to grow and there's way more purpose in life. Totally yeah. true. They're both, they're all totally true. Would I trade money and less stress and well, you know, that kind of freedom for, for what I have now, never, not even close. That's how I kind of had to learn it. You know, myself, that's the way I try to communicate yeah. it a little bit. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I was telling you guys, I'm working on a parenting book right now that talks about a lot of these concepts. The reason that I started writing the parenting book was a lot of people were asking me about our parenting philosophies and even some of the same questions that you guys are asking me right now. Yeah. The problem is my sons are 14. Who's to say they're not going to wind up in prison, you know, and, and who's saying uh, they're, they're not cooked yet. They're not out of the oven. Like they're, they're still, they're, they're you know, they're, 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 if, they're, if they do the, end up the in prison, the parenting model of it'll the be for a good thing, has yet probably to be with proven. <laughs> yes. For a good reason. But, <laughs> the book will be on sale. But I thought, I know like on my podcast and just in a lot of the books I've read about parenting, like I know of and know a lot of really great parents whose children have grown up and been super impactful and who have started amazing organizations and charities yeah. and are changing the world. And, and I had a list of about 60 different parents who I just thought were absolutely amazing. And I generated a list of 32 different questions like, how do you carve out one-on-one -on -one time with your child? How do you engage in your own self-care? How do you tackle the paradox of passing on life wisdom to your child without making them adult, you know, too early in life and stressing the mouse out with, you know, being an adult. And, and so I had all these questions I, and I basically just chose all these parents. I sent them all the questions. And for the past year, I've been getting all the responses back. Some parents are recording the audios and sending them back to me and I'm transcribing them or, okay. or having them transcribed and editing them. Some of them writing them down. Some of them are completing an online form that I made for the questions. But as, you know, as I'm going through this editorial phase and, and the book is, you know, I'm deep in the throes of it, but it won't come out until I think this, this November-ish is what I'm shooting for. But there are common themes that I'm seeing over and over again that are showing me, you know, what kind of habits seem to result in children who don't make the kind of mistakes that, you know, that we, that we voiced some fears about here today. So, um, intentionally carving out one-on-one -on -one 
date time with each child at least on a monthly basis is something I see over and over and over again. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Family dinners, Individually, family right. dinners, yeah. extreme emphasis placed on family dinners, even to the sacrifice of things like evening team sports and, and, and things of that mm-hmm. nature. It's another big one. Um, uh, uh, mom and dad, almost every single set of parents who are super impactful, they've got twice a year, up to four times a year, some type of quarterly two to four day retreat that the parents go on just, just on their own to be able to do family planning and, and, and to connect and to basically plan out everything from education to, to legacy, but is this, this carved out, you know, like a carved out getaway mm-hmm. between the husband and the wife. Um, uh, uh, from a from a uh, uh, disciplinary standpoint, very very similar to what I was talking about earlier, a lot of consequential based discipline, and and not a lot of just like no do this, uh, you know you can't do that, but instead educating the kid on on the consequences of their decisions. So I'm getting all these patterns now that are coming up, and it, it's super interesting. I I don't think all the things that you're doing necessarily are things to prevent your your boys from making so much the wrong decision as much as it is to remind them what the home base looks like i feel like because they're yeah. gonna they're gonna they're gonna make their own choices at one point in their life no matter what and you won't have any control of that right. say and in and you're right they absolutely could end up in prison one time they absolutely could go on a drug bender for a while and right. that doesn't mean what you did failed because i still think because of how consistent you were with raising this way my belief would be that even if they 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 veer off for a little while, they'll remember what that well, looked like. What's that and saying? Then, yeah. And then come back. Yeah. Well, what's yeah. that saying? Is that like you could put carpet all you could carpet the whole world, or you could wear pieces of carpet under your feet. Like it's like raising strong people versus trying to change and protect them from the world. It's impossible. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. And um, yeah, I, I think that uh, that. A, a big thing that I've noticed that has resulted in them having like a lot of, a lot more patience and a lot less of kind of like ADD, ADH like tendencies, which mm. technically I think is a lot of times just being a boy, you know, and, and, you know, the, Hey, look, a squirrel type of mentality that, that a lot of boys have. It kind of shocked me how impactful breath work was oh, sure. in, in terms of, of just that. And, and they love it. They actually asked to do breath work. Like we'll get towards the end of the day. Like dad, when are we going to do a breath work session? And we go down there in the sauna. Oh, the, the app that we're using right now is called other ship. And it's got like everywhere, anywhere from two up to full, like once a month, we do 60 to 90 minute holotropic breath work session. Wow, All wow, three of us wow. guys it's laid out you can hold 12 year olds lay, attention yeah, laid out long. on our back in the sauna. <laughs> and I'm teaching them everything from like, you know, they don't know this yet, but I'm sure they'll be great at tantric sex and everything because they're doing like pelvic breath, like uh, pelvic locks and squeezes. They're doing like, like the, uh, the, the long exhales and hold the big inhales are learning how to, how to move breath up through each of their chakras and shoot the light out the top of their head, almost like the, the Kundalini energy philosophies. And I, I think the breath work, especially for, for a kid is amazing in terms of just giving them a really intimate relationship yeah. with how to control their physiology. And so that's something that, that, you know, it seems it seems kind of trite, but I've noticed a real change in just like their their mentality and their resilience from doing that. Well, yeah. you answered the question mm-hmm. that I was just going to ask, which was, you know, you're doing all these things, of course, to, for for the future. Um, are there th- other things than just that that you're already seeing an impact on? Like, oh wow, that's working, or oh wow, I can tell that was. I'm glad we're definitely doing that because yeah. you're seeing it already unfold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, def- definitely in the breath work, like I talked about, definitely that morning spiritual time, like teaching a, a child about just the, the sacredness of their existence, the sacredness of life, the fact that, that um, you know, we, we are spiritual creatures with a soul and giving them that foundation of waking up in the morning and as the very first thing they do, caring for their soul, engaging in a gratitude practice, engaging in some form of service towards their fellow human beings, you know, learning how to, how to speak with God, mm-hmm. how to listen to God, how to meditate. And I didn't talk about this when I was telling you about the morning journaling practice, but in the evening, same thing. Very last thing we do, we all, we gather together in uh, River and Terran's bedroom. We do typically a song 
We do a story. I still read them a story every night when we're at home. I, I've, I've already told them, I'm like, as soon as you guys are sick of dad telling you bedtime stories, you just tell me right. and I'll stop reading you bedtime stories. Cause I, I, I'm constantly, constantly trying to get a feel for like, God, am I just doing this for me? And they just like <laughs> wish I'd freaking get out of their room already. And, yeah. yeah. But, but no, we do a bedtime story and then we do evening meditation. And the evening meditation is the process of self examination. I think this has been very good for them. It's very good for me too. I, I think. This is, this is probably one of the, the best things I do at the end of each day. I close my eyes. I play the entire day like a movie. The only in my person mind. I've ever heard say do that. I yeah. tell people about that, about yeah. how I've developed self-awareness oh, was exactly oh my goodness. that. It works. And you play, you watch yourself like a third person character going through your whole day. And you, you're asking yourself, what good did I do? What could I have done better? Like where, like what did I fail at that I learned from? And where was I most purpose filled today? So I evaluate and my, whole my emotions of uh, where were my highs, my lows, what made me happy and joyful in the day, yeah. what made me frustrated or down and then yep. unpacking those. Like, why did that make me, why did I get upset at that person and yeah. trying to unpack and get into like the insecurity, which it's normally rooted in exactly and the things that gave me joy, remembering that that's something important. Make sure you build that in your life. Like and you learn a lot a about yourself. It stacks as you do this, it like does. every day gets better. Cause like, if you're doing those three questions, what good have I done? What could I have done better? And where was I most purpose filled? Well, you learn how it is that you structure your day that allows you to do good for other people. You learn about things that you're doing, mistakes that you're making that you really want to want to stop. Like if I, for five days in a row, write down, hey, I really wish I'd have had more time to play music today. Well, eventually I'll get to a point where I'm just like, screw it. I don't want to write this anymore in my journal. I'm going to carve out intentional time to practice my guitar or practice piano. And then where was I most purpose-filled? Well, I mean, like as far as like your ikigai, your purpose, what gets you out of bed each day, if you're writing down each day which activity it was that you felt most purpose-filled, like where you were in the zone, when things were really flowing, when you had a smile on your face and time was going by fast, like that's a clue that can teach you every single day about what it is that you were really put on this planet to do. And so it's this, this positive cycle. And you were talking about some of the questions that you ask, Adam, uh, like those three questions are good. That Another three that, that I really like, um, they're what, what filled me with the most energy today? What drained my energy the most today? And what did I learn about myself today? Like, I like those three questions too. And we, yeah. we'll, we'll kind of go back and forth. Sometimes we'll do those three questions. And sometimes we'll do those other three. What's dope good, is if you practice that on a regular basis every night, you begin to be able to process that on real time. Yeah. That's what I found. Like, because to be honest, I'm not as consistent with that as I was in my like early 20s and even in my 30s. But I've done that so consistently for so many decades now that I can see it happen now in real time because I've practiced that practice every single night of unpacking my day and going like, so then when those feelings arrive, I go, Oh, it's one of those moments. Yeah. So, you know, like, like not at the end of the day, but during any given day, let's say when you're engaged in a certain activity, you can check yourself and ask yourself, is this really a purpose filled activity? Yeah. Am I just spinning my wheels or am I doing something impactful? Right. Or that's, somebody that's, getting me upset and getting emotional is like, Oh, is this really what they're saying? Or is this really my own shit? Right. This right. is probably my own shit right, right now. Not really that, you know, right. the fact that the, the fact that they said something and is making me feel this way has ain't nothing to do with them. And so instead of reacting to that person, I'm already doing the internal work real time because I've practiced that at night for yeah. so long. So yeah. Is this person draining my energy? Is this person filling me with energy? Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's, uh, it's the concept of, of just knowing thyself, right? Yeah. I yeah. think it's one of the most yeah. important practices, personally myself, I've ever practiced in my yeah. life. So, with, yeah. with, cool. with the with the quickly evolving um, society and technology, much faster now than it was when we were kids. Do you look forward and think like, is there anything that worries you with your kids and think, okay, how can I prepare them for this? Or maybe AI or VR is going to get so good, we're going to maybe want to you know, go into technology. Is there anything that you look forward and you go, okay, let's, let's, let's the try to prepare. The only thing that I've gotten a little bit, um, wary about is the metaverse. Yeah. This yeah, idea same. of, even though I see a lot of value, for example, I took part in an online educational session in which I put on the Oculus Quest glasses and I joined a bunch of other people for 
a presentation and we were all in this room together and the PowerPoint was on the wall, but you could like interact with it and walk up to it and then kind of go away from it and talk to some other people. And the closer mm-hmm. you got to those people, the closer their voices became. And it was very realistic and a very enriched learning environment that impressed upon me the idea that when it comes to education or when it comes to being able to interact with people in a very rich environment that you might not be able to travel all the way across the world to or or be with physically, but can be as close to physical interaction digitally, mm-hmm. that there is some value in that. I, I could like for me, I would love to be able to start giving some of my Zoom presentations and my keynotes and some some of the events that I do for places that I can't actually get to to speak. I would love to be able to do those in a little bit more of a metaverse esque scenario. Mm-hmm. Yet when we look at the ability to be able to like, whatever, you know, own virtual real estate or to be able to just basically, you know, live half your life with a headset on, you know, in a digital world, almost like the matrix. And when I, when I look at the emerging landscape of, of, of meta and NFTs and digital art versus analog art, and just this idea that you could technically live a lot of your life tied down to technology. That's the one thing I'm a little worried about. I think it's going to be just like every other virtual virtual existence, very, every other amazing digital technology that we've seen in the past. It's, it's going to be a tool and it's good. There's going to be addictive properties and negative side effects to it, but then there'll be very powerful ways that you can use it to wield good. Any truly Mm -hmm. powerful tool has got a good and a bad side. Yeah, Any, I mean, yeah. one of the, the first massive, you know, and it's new for all of us. Was, it's new for yeah. all of us. So we're nervous. We're worried, whatever. But the truth is that well, it's, look, we just, like, we, we discover fire, right? Well, I mean, it's totally changed mankind and now we can burn each other and, and wage war like never before nuclear power, same thing. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it so dangerous is that it's going to be so revolutionary and so impactful but the potential for, I mean, because I can't even begin to imagine what that could potentially look like for a person who wants to escape, which a lot of us want to escape. I mean, we see that with our- We see that with drugs. I yeah. Mean, it's it's with, very similar. Yeah. People want to escape and feel something different. And like this would provide them a whole new opportunity to experience like a life that they can create in a virtual setting. So right. that is pretty crazy. That's why I think we're going to be yeah. divided. I think we're going to have, we're going to be split almost down the middle of people that choose to be plugged in most of their life. And they choose that life because they think it's better. Yeah. And then the other people the, that recognize that and go like, nah, the real if thing. If I is had better. to choose between, and this is really what I'm focusing on most with my boys, an analog existence that comprises, uh, that, that's comprised of like right now, their their beekeeping and their bow hunting and their gardening and they're outside a lot mm. and they're cooking real food and frankly my sons are they're not total luddites but they are kind of shitty at like technology in general they don't have a phone they kind of sort of know their way around their macbooks but mostly they just use them for word processing their eye touches are mostly for them to listen to music and and you know one of my sons has has a camera he's getting into photography but even that you know it's outdoor nature photography they live a very analog existence i don't think they're ever gonna really you know be the next zuckerberg because of that but i would much rather like i I would much rather them like not make a ton of money because they haven't really tapped into technology in the digital world and the metaverse, but like be able to provide for their families bow hunting and building the house and gardening and, you know, having goats and chickens and that. Like, I just, I like the beauty and the simplicity and the dependency and the realistic aspects of an analog existence far more than I do the idea of a digital. Virtual yeah. And the reality. only thing I disagree with you on that, Adam, is I don't think it'll be down the middle. I think it'll be like 10% or will, will want to be unplugged and 90% will, but I agree that there's going to oh, be, I think it'll be greater than that to I Justin's point of it being like a drug, the same, you think there's only 10% of the population that are addicted to drugs. I think there's, Oh, no, no, no. I hear what you're saying. I think it's going to be like, look at like obesity, for example, at some point. Oh, you think 90 are going to be in the metaverse? Correct. Oh, yeah. oh shit. No, no, okay. No, well, no. then you, I, I, well, I wouldn't bet against you on that. Yeah, I'm yeah, saying yeah. at least half. No, I'm no, I, I agree that there's going to be people on plugs, and, 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 but I think it'll be majority. But I also be. think that it'll sway back to the, what you're saying.
saying too. Like, and, and maybe and, and maybe initially it goes ninety because everybody thinks it's safe and yeah. it's fine, and then we start to see all yeah. the unintended well, consequences of living a life like that. We've taken it for granted, and it, that's typically this is typically how we work as humans, right? The pendulum swings this back and forth like this. And Sometimes so, though, we got to wait. Yeah, until that yeah but it, it really go, crashes. Yeah. You're probably yeah. right. It'll go ninety at one point. I don't disagree with that, and and then uh, but a, a large percentage of those people will start to start to evaluate and start to see some of these yeah. consequences and family members and friends right. and go, oh shit, maybe we got to get out well, of this a little bit. And then I actually think that that this though the things that you're teaching your boys actually will come back into favor and it mm -hmm. will be something that people will talk more about people and it'll will be, be drawn yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I really do. Maybe because it'll be counterculture, right? Exactly. Counterculture tends to be popular. That's right. It'll just be that solar flare that happens in 2084. <laughs> 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 really forced. Makes people it. realize know, who <laughs> who the truly valuable humans yeah. are and yeah. who you know, the pale, weak, easy to kill <laughs> folks in their basement with a virtual reality well, headset I, on. I know Arthur Brooks ready for the alien. Uh, Arthur, so. Arthur Brooks said they'll you eat the, them first for sure. They'll be uh -huh. easy, easy no, prey. Easy with that billboard, that 24 hour Fitness ad yeah, when yeah, they come yeah. to eat the fat ones first. Yeah. No, Arthur Brooks said, like, when you meet with people digitally, you get the same dopamine response as you get in real life, but you don't get the oxytocin. Uh huh. So you get the addictive yeah, the drive, bonding. but you don't get the bonding, like, you know, nourishing, same effect. So it's, right. it's so that's why it's like, a, it's like drinking ocean water. It's a high without the yeah. love, yeah. right? But of course, you can get intranasal oxytocin and fix that. Just, you know, yeah. a little nasal spray, and then you yeah. got the best of both worlds, Have it just right? yeah. <laughs> Arthur Brooks is great, by the way. That oh, he's book, amazing. Strength to Strength, that he he's wrote awesome. is really he's good. I did a, a documentary or a docu-series down in Salt Lake City on happiness. I just finished filming it. It'll come out in October. Oh, I interviewed cool. like 40 of the world's leading experts on happiness, you know. And, and, he's the man. And oh, yeah. Where happiness is actually uh, derived from, with with really like I probably uh, could could sum the whole thing down to just basically you know ninety nine point nine percent of of the lessons that I learned boiled down to just like this Victor Frankel esque yep. philosophy of yeah yep. choose happiness right don't seek happiness just see happiness in whatever scenario that you're in rather than sitting with angst about whatever situation that you're in whether it's traffic or stress or your job or relationship or an argument yeah. or whatever, you realize that most of the emotions that you feel that tend to drag you down are emotions that you I kind of feel the same way about love. Do you feel the same way about love? I feel like yeah. that's the same kind of philosophy with that. I think so many yeah. people are waiting for love or chasing love when it's like you right. choose to love, you know? Well, yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, exactly. You, you choose to love like, like, um, in, in a relationship, like my relationship with my wife, I I think that a lot of people they think that you are just going to have this burning hot romantic passion your entire life and in many cases you actually have to go out of your way and 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 you have to almost generate love say I love you and and go out of your way to love that person and and, and sometimes it does feel like sacrifice a little bit but yeah but you 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 choose to love you almost create love but but yeah back to this this docuseries, uh, Arthur was one of the people that I wound up interviewing for it. And his interview was just great. I remember at the very, very end, he said, Ben, it comes down to, I think it was, it was uh, seven words, seven words. Most people will, um, they'll, they'll use people, they'll love thing, they'll use people, love things, worship themselves. I guess that's six words, right? Mm -hmm. Use people, love things, worship themselves. When really the key to happiness is love people, use things, worship God. Yeah. Mm. And he he finished with that kind of like a mic drop moment at the end of the interview. And I just thought it was great. Oh, he, he's, he's I, I'd never heard of him before. And then when I interviewed him, I was like, oh, this yeah, guy. Yeah, no, he's, he's a good friend. Amazing. I talked yeah. I, I talk to him all Yeah, time. I really like him. Yeah, no, I think uh, people fall in love. They, they for lack of a better term, they fall in love with the feeling of love when mm -hmm. it's that's not <coughs> love is an action and it's 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 the choice right yeah it's not the feeling that comes with it sometimes and it come but like all feelings come and go but you have to choose uh the action if you fall in love with the feeling yeah. you're screwed because you, you're not gonna be with someone for 20 30 40 or well, you years may or more wait, you may end up waiting your entire life and all you had to do was choose to do it <laughs> versus you yeah know, thinking that it's going to hit you over the head which what? honestly this is how i thought that way you know i thought it wasn't i didn't understand well, that's what did, movies show you yeah i did not think it was like that as a kid growing up i assumed that you everyone would tell you like oh you'll just know when you're in love and you fall in love and you just keep so you have that thought process mm -hmm. when it's like you know it wasn't until my late 20s 30s even possibly where i was like real 
realize like, oh my God, love is an action. It's a choice. It's something mm-hmm. that I have to choose to do. And yeah, then it like completely <laughs> dawned on me. You know? Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, gosh, like, like I, my, my wife and I, we, I would say like the top things we do right now, cause our relationship is just magical. It's, it's so good. Like we're just so in love and we're so bonded and, you know, knock on wood, we're just mm-hmm. like yoked spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally, everything. But, uh, first of all, we, we have a policy that we're able to come up to the other person and have a no judgment conversation, like total transparency. And you can just read the riot act of that person. Their only responsibility is just to be a sounding board to hear everything about you that they're annoyed about or something that's really bothering them about you. And it's not an argument. You're literally just there to listen and say, okay, thank you. If you have something against them, that's not time to bring it up. Mm-hmm. You do it. You layer, but it's just basically, we know that we can come to each other anytime. And just be like, Hey, look, I, I need no judgment zone vent here. And then you're just able to lay it all out to that person and not have them feel as though they're going to be offended or have to argue back or give a bunch of reasoning for, for why they did. It's just a chance for you to talk to the other person. And it sounds like it would be frustrating for the person who's receiving it, which it is sometimes, but, but for the most part, it allows us to be super transparent without the fear of the other person judging you or getting angry at right, you right. for what it is that you're expressing. So we do that. And then we pray together every night, like last thing, as soon as our heads hit the pillow, like even if it's, if we're just exhausted at the end of the day and it's just like 30 seconds, we always pray at the end of each day. So we're kind of like <clears throat> yoked spiritually as well. And then between that and like the quarterly retreats that we go on and the family dinners and, you know, the morning and evening meditation, like we're just, it, it's really, really good right now. Yeah, Do you great. find uh, your, you know, your passion for fatherhood is growing, maintaining, like, how do you feel as fatherhood? A, yeah. Oh, it's definitely grow. I mean, you know, as as your kids get old, they just become more fun to hang out with. They're <laughs> funny and their sense of humor gets better and yeah. you know the jokes that they tell get better and and they're yep. stronger and faster and start to challenge you physically and now when we play family tennis, you know, they're like good and like though they as a team can go up against mom and I and oh, cool. you know it's, it's kind of nice cuz like gosh, I can remember them too they could barely hit the ball and now <laughs> and now it's fun to like play with. yeah now we we've invested in that skill in them and and yeah and and it's just yeah there's there's we we just got done uh hiking for 10 days we hiked 5 days in the Sedona and 5 days in the Grand Canyon and put over 90 miles in in about 10 days and and just had an amazing time together That's just cool. hike all day buy a couple cheap sets of playing cards play cards at night and go to sleep, wake up, do the next, do the thing the next day. And yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the family right well, now. Well, good deal, yeah. man. Well, you're yeah, always, cool. always fun to yeah. talk to you, man. Yeah, yeah. I love, I love yeah. picking your brain. You're a great guy, very like smart that. dude, very interesting. And uh, it's good to hear the stuff about Yeah, I'm family. super pumped about yeah. the family legacy thing. I'm so going to pick those books up totally. and dive into that. I think, yeah. that's, I yeah, think that's, that's rad. Great, oh great man, idea. yeah, I'm excited for the book. It's going to be called, I'm going to call it Boundless Parenting. I'm going to build it on the, on the Boundless series. Called oh Boundless oh Parenting. yeah, good deal. Yeah, I just, I just got all the coverage. And are you going to, are you going to implement some of those things that you talked about with the family legacy that you learn and everything like from the Rockefellers? Is it going to be in your book? Yeah, is it oh, gonna, for sure. Oh, okay. oh cool. Yeah. For sure. Not yeah. that, but like well, the guy who owns that Legato Foundation, uh, his name is Rich Christensen. He's he's one of the featured parents. In oh, the really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited for that yeah. one. We're going yeah. cool. to make matching. So, but it's pretty, I mean, it spans a gamut. I mean, freaking Paul checks in there with two wives and, you know, yeah. all the way down to like, you know, Mormon genealogy, parenting and legacy people in yeah. Salt Lake. Like, so it's, it's, it's a wide Balanced. spectrum of yeah. parents. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. cool. I'm going to go make matching yeah. leather jackets. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. Right on, right on, dude. Always good seeing you. Thanks, man. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. You too, guys. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. Thanks.